Hello and welcome back to The Wandering Wind, and this is another episode of my podcast, The Truth Is. Now, in the last podcast episode, we talked about how Jesus loves you, and he does. He loves all of you. He loves every single one of us equally. But considering the time of year that it is, um, I wanted to talk about another truth that goes alongside that, because while Jesus loves you, Christ also died for you. Um, Considering it's Holy Week, and this is going to be um, Ash Wednesday tomorrow, and then also, um, well, wasn't it already Ash Wednesday? I don't know. I don't know the days or anything about things. (laughs) Let's see, Ash Wednesday 2024. It was probably already passed, honestly. Ash Wednesday... 2024. Yeah, it was back in February. My de- my bad. Anyway, so um, it is going to be Good Friday this week, though. So in preparation for that, I want to talk about the crucifixion and just how powerful it is that Jesus died for us. First of all, I want to talk about a few um, interesting little-known facts about the story of the crucifixion. One of them that I learned um, quite a while back and that I heard again last night at a group I was at is how in the Word... No, it wasn't... Well, yeah, it was at a group I was at last night. I also read it. I also listened to it on the radio. Funny how that keeps coming up. But in the Word, during the story of the crucifixion, At one point, Jesus says, I thirst. And when he says this, a Roman soldier takes his spear and puts a sponge on the end of it. They would get these sea sponges from the ocean and use them for various things. But he would get a sponge. He got a sponge on on a spear and dipped it into a bucket full of vinegar. Now, what you need to realize about this Back in Roman times, they had public bathrooms. And they actually had plumbing in those bathrooms. They had running water that went through the entire stall area that would carry away waste and stuff. So you did your business and the running water would take it away. That was really innovative. What they didn't have, though, was today's, um, was pretty much today's butt paper, you know, toilet paper. They didn't have that back then. So what they did was they took buckets of vinegar, which was known to be cleansing and um, kind of a uh, um, almost a sterilizing substance. And then they would take these sea sponges and put them on the ends of sticks and use that in order to wipe your butt. They used the same thing at the site where they were crucifying people. Soldiers would go and use the restroom and come back and wipe their butt with that and put it back in the in the bucket in order to sterilize it for the next person as best they could. When they gave him that sponge, it had already been used, I'm sure. So he was literally being insulted one last time. You know, for years I thought, oh, well, that was nice, that one soldier. No, that was just yet another mockery of our Lord and Savior. Yet another mockery. That said, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna completely and utterly trash you as much as we can because we don't think you're worth anything. Jesus suffered a lot on this week. He comes in on Palm Sunday to cries of Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, which basically the word Hosanna means. God, please save us. God, please deliver us. And then he goes to the temple and has to throw out basically criminals from the temple yard because they're doing business in a way that does not honor God. And then they take they take that and use that in order to be some sort of testimony in order to frame Jesus for crimes. 
And Jesus tells them the truth at his trial. He says, I am the Christ. I am the Son of the living God. You will see me coming to the power at the right hand of the Father. And they tear their clothes as, as a sign that they were so distressed about this supposed just mere mortal man making such blasphemous claims. And they say, well, let's, let's take him to the Roman leader. So they take him to Pontius Pilate, who is the um, Roman consul, uh, kind of like today's uh, senators or even um, something even lower than that. Not mayor, but like something in between senator and mayor, maybe po some sort of political state. Anyway, so they take him to Pilate and Pilate says, all right, I'll, I'll see him. I'll talk to him. And Pilate doesn't want to get involved because Pilate is forever a politician and forever someone who just wants to keep the peace between the Romans and the, and the Jews and not have any trouble because if there's trouble, he gets blamed and then he gets in trouble. So there's that. So he finally just says, I wash my hands of this ceremonially dips his hand, hands into a bowl of water and basically says, you deal with it. I ain't doing it. And so, so the Jews, the religious leaders, the ones who supposedly knew the scriptures word for word and were able to keep them. And yet the only thing they kept as Jesus kind of confronted them with was their own rules and regulations. They put on top of the word, put on top of the law because the law only really requires 10 things, the 10 commandments. All the rest of that stuff was basically um, prescribed, but it wasn't like the law. The law was always just the 10 commandments. But then the scribes and the Pharisees come along and they're like, no, 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 no. You not only had to keep the 10 commandments, you also had to keep this and this and this and this to the point to where the only ones who looked squeaky clean in their eyes was themselves. And yet Jesus confronts them and says, you are nothing more than whitewashed tombs. You're clean on the outside, but on the inside, on the inside, you've got nothing but dead men's bones. You're literally dead on the inside and you don't see it. And this is powerful because you don't see this. In a lot of cases, you don't see people being confronted so vehemently to the point to where yeah you look good but you ain't good and Jesus is doing this and so then Jesus is brought to the, the place of execution known as the skull Golgotha and he's well but first before that they flog him they flog him so much that he bleeds in fact if you've ever watched the passion of the Christ and seeing just the swaths of blood in the area after they get done with him. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. And then they take him and they mock him. And they make him carry his cross all that way. I think it's like a three mile journey. From where they flogged him. To where they crucified him. I'm not sure. It's a long ways. At one point, Joseph of Arimathea had to actually help him carry the cross. We hear about this. And then we get, they get there, and they nail him to that cross. But by then nailing him to hit that cross, and then having him die, he does three things. First, he says one major thing that we need to remember that I was that was brought to my attention last night he says father forgive them for they knew not what they do they know not what they do father forgive them you know he was hurt so severely let me ask you something when's the last time that you forgave someone that had completely and utterly hurt you severely. When is the last time you forgave someone that had hurt you so deeply that it had been years 
since you've been able to feel good about that situation? How many years did it take you to forgive them? I say this to myself too, you know, how many years has it been since I've forgiven someone who's hurt me? And can I forgive them? Jesus had people mocking him, striking him, tearing his flesh off, and and then nailing him to a cross. And within within not even a day's worth of time, he's saying, Father, forgive them. They do they do not know what they're doing. Within a day. And yet sometimes it takes us years even a lifetime to get to that same point. So point number one for me is that if he can forgive in such little time, what's stopping us? What's stopping us? The second thing is, he says, Father, or he says, I thirst. He didn't merely mean I thirst because I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty in the flesh. No, he was thirsting after the presence of his father. Because previous to this, he says, in order to fulfill the scriptures, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because when he took on the burden of sin, he had to face separation from God. God does not look on sin. He cannot look on sin. So when the burden of sin came fully upon Christ, God the Father turned away. And because of this, Jesus felt the punishment that we face for our sins. Not that God gives us, but that we bring upon ourselves. Be very clear about that. God doesn't send good people to hell. We send ourselves because we don't repent. We send ourselves to hell because we don't repent. It's a very hard take. It's a very hard pill to swallow, I know. But it's something that we have to face. That just because we don't like it doesn't mean it's not the truth. The biggest problem with this is that we tend to say, well, God is doing this to me. God made me feel this way. God, God doesn't force us to do anything. Satan influences us, but even he can't force us. But God doesn't force us, even though he could. The third thing he says, it is finished. Before he dies, before he goes, when the work is done, he said, it is finished. That happened 2,000 years ago. Get this. That happened 2,000 years ago. That thing you're holding on to that you can't forgive yourself for because you can't ever imagine that Jesus would, for, would forgive you for that. Guess what? He already did. The work's been done for 2,000 years. Stop holding him on the cross. The work's been done for 2,000 years. Don't negate it by saying that Jesus wouldn't. He already has. He already has. We do this so often to ourselves. We say, no, no, Jesus would never forgive me. Jesus would never forgive us. Let me just lift, list off a few things that I'm sure everyone has thought about. I'm sure there are a lot of us that are thinking about these things. You know, Jesus would never forgive an abuser, um, um, an unfaithful spouse, uh, a murderer, a thief. A, 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 a tax collector. Oh, get this, get this. Matthew was a tax collector. Jesus forgave him. And guess what? Tax collectors in Jewish times were considered worse than traitors. Um, by the way, he would never forgive a traitor. He would never forgive a, a, a... You name it. You name it. There are plenty of different titles that the world throws at you and says, Jesus would never forgive you because of your title. You know... In recovery, we talk a lot about how the world will give us labels, will give us designations of who they think we are. 
And Jesus says, <laughs> I know that child. And I know that child better than you do. And I know their name, and it's not what you say it is. Finally, Jesus said, when he finally passes, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He earlier in the Bible says, I give up my life. I lay it down willingly. No one takes my life from me. That was even true of the Father himself. Jesus gave his life to the Father. Jesus gave his life for you and for me and for all mankind. Why? God loved the world in this way. That he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. Not some pie-in-the-sky ethereal existence in heaven, but no, eternal, physical, bodily, new body life with God here on the new earth. On a new earth with a new heaven, with an eternal throne in, that is meant for the one who created us. God did that because he loves you so much. You know, I'm reminded of the story of Abraham and Lot and, and, the, and the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Abraham asks God, would you not destroy the city for five righteous people? And God says, I would not destroy for even five. I think it's five. Five or ten something like that. I don't like to get it right. <laughs> Abraham not destroying. For the sake of ten. And then for the sake of ten he would not destroy it. That's what, the, that's what the Bible says. For the sake of one, he would send his son. For the sake of one, for the sake of you, right there, you, you, he sent his son. If you were the only person in existence that needed his salvation, I'm sure God would send him for you. Why? Not because you're special. Because I'm not special. My pastor is not special. My other pastor is not special. My brothers in Christ aren't special. No one on this earth is special. But because God is special and because Jesus is special. I'm forgiven not because of what I've done, but because what of he because of what he's done for me. That's the most important part of all of this, you know. As we go into this Easter season, as we go into this Easter weekend, remember, just because the world says you can't be forgiven doesn't mean you can't be. Just because the world says that you aren't good enough doesn't mean you're not. It just means God is good enough. Jesus is good enough. And that's good enough for you, and it's good enough for me, and it's good enough for all of us. You know why? Because God is good. God is light, God is love, and God is peace on this earth when there is none. He is love on this earth when there is none. He is joy on this earth when there is none. Thank you guys so very much for being here, for listening, watching, sharing, subscribing, being a part of this podcast, part of this channel, part of this ministry that I have. That, that God has given me and God has shown me that, yes, this is the important work that I have for you. As we move on, let us continue to cre create moments to just revel and 
glory in who God is. I thank you for your time here today. I thank you for your attendance. Please share this with someone who needs to hear the truth about who Jesus says they are. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.